So you have to postulate a lot of new particles to get supersymmetry. At least one new particle for every particle in the standard model. So the electron would have a partner, which was its superpartner, which had a different spin, spin zero. And the Z boson would have a partner, which had spin a half, et cetera. And these would be related by the symmetry. So with supersymmetry, we find that there should be at least one of these new particles which is stable. Why is that? Well, we know baryon number, the number of baryons, it seems to be conserved. As far as we know, lepton number, the number of difference between leptons and antileptons is conserved. If you, as far as we know, spin, angular momentum, is conserved. If you take every new particle, you can assign to it a kind of parity, like the usual parity, but not the same thing. That is a, a, a parity charge of plus or minus one, parity even or odd, where this parity charge is minus one to the power twice the spin plus three times the baryon minus the lepton number. Now it happens, if you look at the quarks, um, this exponent is uh, even. They are even. If you look at the Higgs boson, this exponent is even, it's even. If you look at the weak bosons, the photon, the graviton, it's even. All the particles we know about are, are parity even. So it's kind of a dumb symmetry if you look at the standard model. It doesn't predict anything. Nothing has any non-trivial charge. But if you look at the superpartners, their spin is different. And everything else is the same. So all the superpartners are R-parity odd. And therefore, the lightest particle that carries R-parity should be stable. And, OK, it should be massive. Maybe it's neutral. Perfect. It could be dark matter. So this is, you know, this chain of arguments was convincing for many years. Um, and then what really was convincing was when you start taking the theory very seriously and doing the thermodynamics of the WIMP in the early universe. So in the early universe, temperature was very hot. The weak interactions, even though today they're very weak, you know, it was hot and dense enough so that the weak interactions were in thermal equilibrium. Particles were scattering very many times during the age of the universe by a weak interaction. So therefore, you should have produced as many WIMPs as you needed to be in thermal equilibrium. Now, in thermal equilibrium, you have the Boltzmann distribution of WIMPs. Um, 1 over e to the minus m over t. There's this plus or minus 1 for fermions and bosons. We can ignore that. So this, there's this Boltzmann factor at low temperature. But they should populate this factor. And then as the temperature decreases, the universe expands, the temperature decreases, the population should continue to track this Boltzmann abundance. But notice the Boltzmann abundance starts to drop exponentially fast. It just drops. It drops, it drops. So they eventually the WIMPs become very, very dilute if they track the abundance, which means that our assumption that they're in thermal equilibrium is going to fail at some point. They're not going to be able to find each other to annihilate and have their number density drop. Um, so we can do a calculation. The annihilation rate, the rate at which any WIMP would find somebody to annihilate with, it goes like flux times cross-section. Flux goes like density times velocity. Cross-section is a weak cross-section. And then it has to annihilate within the lifetime of the universe. And at that time, the Hubble constant was much higher. The universe was young. And the age of the universe is about 1 over the Hubble constant always. So what happens then if you do this calculation, flux cross-section time to get the you know, number of chance to annihilate, you find um, since the temperature is decreasing, the number density is decreasing exponentially fast, the age of the universe is growing, but um, you can figure out, you can relate the temperature to the age of the universe. And you can sort of put these factors together and say, OK, once the WIMP can't find anybody to annihilate with within the age of the universe, it's not going to annihilate. So then the density of WIMPs is in co-moving coordinates just fixed. 
the physical density will dilute due to the space expanding, but the, so that's the only way it'll change. We call that freeze out. The abundance is frozen. I got a picture of how that works, taken from uh, the thesis of somebody at Eastern Mediterranean University. I stole it. Okay. So, um, so the picture. So you assume there's this qualitative picture of WIMPs, sometimes called chi, annihilating into ordinary particles. The universe cools, they become too dilute to annihilate anymore. Um, and then um, they just get stuck in the expansion of the universe. So this shows the fraction of the critical density provided by dark matter. This line here would be if they were following the Boltzmann abundance. They would keep dropping, dropping, dropping. As the temperature drops, they would annihilate. Here's the temperature going this way, going down, decreasing temperature. But what happens is at some point, depending on how strongly, how strong the cross section is, they, um, they freeze out. It becomes a constant fraction of the critical density. And so you would have less if you had bigger cross section and more if you had weaker cross section. So this is led to something called the Wimp miracle, namely when you figure out what cross section you need to get the right abundance, it looks very typical of the weak interactions. You know, so indeed, if you just say, you know, we've seen particles with this mass and cross So the current status is gotten kind of depressing. Uh, so here's the WIMP nucleus cross section, and notice how small these numbers are. So back in the day, 10 to the minus 39 would have been a nice guess for the cross section. But um, now we see experiments going down at this 10 to the minus 44, 10 to the minus 45 level. And so here's the limits versus the WIMP mass. They're most sensitive when the WIMP mass is sort of similar to the nucleus. And there's, you can see all these lines. Each one is a different experiment. Each one is hundreds of person years of work. And all they're producing is these lines which keep going down. Um, eventually, they will hit this so-called floor where there's a background that they can't get rid of from cosmic neutrinos scattering off the nucleus. Or maybe they'll find it. But anyway, so the experiments keep getting more and more sensitive following Moore's law. They, w they are heading right towards that floor with the next generation. And I had the good luck to visit uh, the snow lab a few years ago. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really quite impressive. So there's an army of students, and they have to get fully trained to be miners before they're even allowed to go in the mine. So if physics doesn't work out, they can be miners. And then they have to, every day, to go to work, to go do their PhD. They have to spend an hour each way just to get to their laboratory. I had to do the same thing just to get in. They get dressed in a mining suit. This is the mining suit you get. You, you walk, you take a very deep, fast elevator, then you walk a couple kilometers through this dirty mine. You then go into a clean room, which requires you take off everything. You take a shower with your glasses on. It has to be washed. You put on different clothes that are always kept in the clean room. There a hat, and then you can go look at the experiments, which are beautiful, and there are very many of them. And then you have to undo that to come up to the surface at the end of the day. Yeah, so I don't know if there should feel guilty about so many people spending their lives this far underground or not, but it's quite impressive. A much more pleasant way to look for dark matter of this type to look for WIMPs is called indirect detection. Um, this is dark matter that might be in our galaxy. You know, we know, we say it frozen out, but if some of it will still annihilate. There's some chance some will annihilate, and then it should annihilate into ordinary particles. So you look for those things that annihilate into photons, neutrinos, positrons. If it annihilates, it annihilates into equal amounts of matter and antimatter. So you look for antimatter. Uh, antiprotons, antideuterons even. The relic, we, we have a cross section we expect for it. Uh, we look for all of these things. There's a large number of experiments. Also, um, 
Many of the experiments are satellite experiments in space, looking for uh, antimatter. Um, uh, if it annihilates into neutrinos, there's experiments at the South Pole looking for neutrinos underground that might be coming from dark matter annihilation. Uh, so this shows um, the ice cube experiment, which is an experiment in Antarctica. There's a proposal to instrument it more densely called Pingu, which would have a good chance of seeing neutrinos from dark matter annihilating. And you can also look for photons. Of course, there's a lot of astrophysical sources of photons, but there are claims sometimes that there are photons that aren't accounted for by astrophysics. That's always a chancy thing. It could be from dark matter annihilation. And finally, I think the most pleasant way to look for it is to try and make them in a collider. So you, this shows two dark matter particles, two standard model particles. You can look at this diagram in different directions. So direct detection shows dark matter scatters off of a nucleus. Indirect detection shows two dark matter particles annihilate and they produce something you can see. And then finally, you could collide two protons at a collider and try and make some dark matter. And then what you look for is um, an imbalance that shows that something flew out. So here's a simulated event where you see a bunch of stuff that was made in your collider. Notice it's mostly on one side. Uh, the momentum doesn't seem to have been conserved. You assume something you didn't see went out the other way. Okay, so this is all I have to say about WIMPs. And I guess I have 15 minutes to talk about axions. So it's motivated by a potential new conservation law, supersymmetry, and the WIMP miracle. Haven't seen anything yet. Any questions? Okay. Axions. Um, this is a really exciting time for axions because the experiments that should see them if the theories are on the right track are just getting going now. So these are motivated by a, an actual problem in particle physics called the strong CP problem. This is the problem of um, why, mainly it's about the neutron and atoms, why there are no electric dipole moments, fundamental electric dipole moments observed. And so an electric dipole moment, so this shows an electric, it would just be like if a neutron had an excess of positive charge in one direction and minus charge in the other. Um, and why doesn't it? Um, well, if it did, it would violate parity and it would violate time reversal invariance. I guess we're going to hear something about that. It would violate time reversal invariance because, okay, so the neutron, the only axis this could ally it is the spin. Um, time reversal invariance would flip the spin in the other direction. Time reversal, well, the spin would go the other way, so it would violate time reversal. Uh, parity um, would reverse the charges and not the spin, so it would violate P and T. And it, um, it would theoretically also violate charge conjugation times parity. And it turns out that our theory of the strong interactions has a parameter which is called the strong CP parameter, which violates the symmetry. And so in order to satisfy the experimental bounds, you have to set this parameter to something smaller than about 10 to the minus 9, which is just weird. There doesn't seem to be any reason for that. Um, and so another coincidence, or is there some reason for it? So there was an elegant solution proposed by Pache and Quinn, which was to say maybe this parameter is actually something dynamical, a field, something that can change in space and time. So they replaced this strong CP interaction with a field called A for axion. And for, by dimensional analysis, you have to put another dimensionful constant, it's called F axion, um, in front of it. And then 
For some reason, Pache and Quinn didn't realize that this meant if you have a field, you have a particle, but Weinberg and Wilczek did. Okay, so the basic way Pache and Quinn did it is they figured out if you add some kind of complex boson field, something like the Higgs, but different to the standard model and couple it to quartz in the right way, and you spontaneously prove uh, there's a symmetry going around this circle at the bottom, symmetrical situation, but notice this surface here, the minimum is lies somewhere on the circle at the bottom. The symmetrical point is not a minimum. So the ground state of the theory is not symmetrical. It just arbitrarily picks some point. That's called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And then I, theoretically you can show that the symmetry is not exact. QCD violates it. So you actually tip this wine bottle and you have a light particle, not massless, associated with the oscillations of this field. Okay, so it's very beautiful. The axion is this oscillating field which solves the strong CP problem. It has, uh, all its couplings are set by a new scale called F axion. Its mass goes like one over F axion, all its couplings go like one over F axion. So the beautiful thing is it turns out when you start figuring out what's the cosmology of the axion, you immediately discover that the axion, if it exists, really, really wants to be dark matter. It's, it's hard to make it not be dark matter. So the reason is the, the way you work out the symmetry. So you start during the Big Bang, some finite temperature, and you haven't broken the symmetry yet. Then when you break the symmetry, the axion picks some arbitrary direction to roll down. And the axion mass doesn't become important until the temperature is very low, and that's when the axion field starts oscillating. Now, why is that dark matter? Uh, let's figure out why that's dark matter. I've got a few equations here. This might be too late in the day for equations, but they're pretty simple. So radiation-dominated universe, Hubble constant goes like temperature squared over Planck scale. And I put this squiggle here so I don't have to put down the 8 pi over 3 and stuff like that. Okay. And the age of the universe is inverse Hubble scale. And then, okay, which is true during the radiation dominated universe. And finally, the temperature is always going down like 1 over the scale factor. And the entropy is going like 1 over the scale factor cubed. Okay, so now we want to see, you know, if you ever want to figure out if you've got dark matter, you can basically use these very simple equations. You can, you can always you know, just do these really literally on the back of an envelope to figure out if it's at least roughly working out, if you can just remember those, those simple equations. So one fact you need to remember is the total energy density in dark matter over the en entropy density today is about one electron volt. And this quantity should be approximately conserved. They both just dilute like 1 over A cubed. So you just work out whether you've got this quantity and you're done. So it's really not that complicated to figure out if you've got the right amount of dark matter. Okay, so why is this oscillating axion field dark matter? Okay, so I've got to throw one more equation. This is the equation for an oscillating field. It looks like a harmonic oscillator, second time derivative of A. You put it in an expanding universe and you get this term that looks like 3h times the first time derivative. h is the Hubble constant. This looks like friction. And then you've got the mass term looking like the frequency. So if you didn't have this friction term, it would be simple harmonic oscillator. With the Hubble expansion, it looks like a damped harmonic oscillator. And what does a damped harmonic oscillator do? Well, if there's too much friction, it doesn't do anything. And if there's not enough friction, it oscillates. So at late times, we just have this oscillating axion. Right? The Hubble scale keeps going down and down. The axion is oscillating. And the energy of an oscillating field looks like time derivative squared plus ma squared a squared. And the pressure looks like the difference. And then, you know, for a harmonic oscillator, kinetic energy 
is on the average is the same as the tensile energy, so it's pressureless. So again, we can now invoke the duct theorem and say this oscillating axion field has energy density and no pressure, right? And therefore, you must also be able to think of it as just non-interacting fluid of particles, invoking the duct theorem again. So the axion just sort of can't help but turn into dark matter. You, it's really pretty unavoidable. So the rough estimate, if you actually put in numbers, is that you get about the right amount of energy density in axions as a function of the um, axion scale, F axion, if you put in that very big scale, 10 to the 11 GeV for this scale, which means the axion is very light. And you, know, you can fix this slightly. It comes out pretty soon. So anyway, so notice one thing this implies is that F axion has an upper bound. If you make F axion bigger, the axion lighter, you've got more axions. And um, another thing I should say is not only does the axion really want to be dark matter, solve the strong CP problem, but theorists really love axions. It's very, this, this symmetry that was invoked by Piché and Quinn, it's almost unavoidable when you start thinking, you know, grand unified theories, things like that. It just, it pops out a string theory very easily and solves the strong CP problem. So this is partly why the axion is so fascinating. You know, there's been I counted you know, very easily 5,000 papers referencing this. Um, it solves two major problems. It appears in string theory. Uh, it might create problems, creating more papers. It's very cool, the theory. And the experiments, when we get to the experiments, they're just coming online. The ones that could really find it are coming online now. So how do we find the axion? If they are the dark matter, they're all around us. How do we find them? So the focus has been on the fact that the axion has a predicted coupling to two photons. In particular, it couples to the electric field dotted into the magnetic field. And uh, the most sensitive experiments make use of a microwave cavity, which is tuned to a resonance at half the axion mass. And they put in one of these photons virtually by putting in a very high magnetic field. And then they try and, so the axion in the presence of the magnetic field oscillates into the electric photon that would be in the cavity. These are very, very sensitive experiments. Uh, the name of the experiment that is at my institution is called ADMX, Axion Dark Matter Experiment. Here's a picture of it. Here's the great big magnet, it goes into a dilution refrigerator, goes down there, they're running right now. They have very sensitive quantum radio electronics to so look for this very weak photon that might appear. Um, the electronics are so sensitive that they would provide your cell phone four bars on Jupiter. They are you know, insanely sensitive. And so, the published limits of ADMX is versus the axion mass and the axion coupling. The theory predicts the axion should lie in this purple line. The published limits just barely touch it. The current run, and they're looking at data every day now, will cover this green region. Uh, the next run will cover that light green region. The goal is to cover the entire allowed region. And then find the axion or roll it out. Okay, I've exhausted you completely, but there's a whole bunch of other theories of dark matter out there, um, which I'm not going to talk about. These, uh, this slide was made by um, Tim Kate during our snow mass exercise about, he, and he literally, he thought pretty hard about this. Every single, this is not just randomly sketched out. He really did a survey of all the theories there are out there in the literature and how dark different kinds of dark matter fit into everything and created a Venn diagram of it. Um, I won't lead you through it, but you actually could walk through it and understand every bit of it if you